Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I, I, I'm noticing that uh, there was some real thought put into the order of uh, these presentations because I think this is going to build nicely on, on the two presentations before. So as was mentioned, uh, I work for an anti-hunger agency. We're a statewide anti-hunger agency in Massachusetts, Project Red the Walk for Hunger. And I'm often asked why we are interested in school meals. And I want to share a little bit of context with you. Um, the, uh, the study results that I'm about to share with you are the result of a partnership since 2006 with the Harvard School of Public Health, um, looking at a chefs in schools program, um, putting uh, classically trained chefs into public school settings to, to help uh, train school food service professionals on how to menu, prepare, and present healthier meals. Uh, and we're interested in this work. Um, because there is a hungry kids uh, suffer disproportionately uh, with a number of health related um, diseases that are affected by diet. Um, if you look at the chart here, this is a <coughs> this is a scatter plot of free reduced lunch um, eligibility in our state um, by district, along with uh, some research that was done by the Mass Department of Public Health around childhood obesity. And what you see is there's a very strong correlation between poverty and the incidence of overweight and obesity. And not only is it a percentage issue, but if you look at the size of the bubbles, uh, the districts that tend to be poorer and uh, suffer disproportion disproportionately from overweight and obesity also tend to be larger. So we've got a scale issue here as well. And drawing back on Dr. Giles' presentation, um, there are a number of outcomes uh, associated with obesity and overweight uh, that can trap children uh, in a poverty hunger cycle. Um, it directly impacts the way that they uh, perform at school, directly impacts the way that they perform at work, and can really trap people in a cycle for a long time. So breaking that chain uh, is really important, and so we're focused on school meals as a result. Um, Low-income students rely on more than uh, on school meals for more than 50% of their daily calories. Uh, but one thing that really needs to be stated clearly is that the food that's offered in schools and does not necessarily equal what the kids are taking or consumed. And for us to have a really, um, a really impactful uh, impact on what kids are actually, uh, on what the public health outcomes are for kids, we have to measure what they're actually consuming. And so, We've conducted plate waste studies, um, both in the Boston public schools and other large districts across the state for a number of years. Um, and it basically looks at the average consumption uh, of what kids are eating uh, and what they're throwing away. And I'm going to share some of the results uh, with you. Uh, the, the study design starts with picking the schools, uh, obtaining student and parent consent, um, collecting data um, on what kids are actually um, what kids are eating and what they're leaving on the trays at the end of the lunch period, um, analyzing the difference and then documenting and, and disseminating the findings. Um, we conducted uh, data collection in four low-income schools um, with high free and reduced lunch eligibility. Um, we conducted this uh, research on four non-consecutive days, uh, twice in the fall of 2011, prior to the implementation of the new uh, school lunch guidelines. And then again in the fall in 2012, post-implementation. This is part of a broader piece of work that we're doing around our chefs in schools program. And these are the, the control schools for that. So no chef intervention occurred in these schools, um, but we were able to measure the change in consumption rates based on the implementation of the new guidelines. Uh, we conducted our uh, data analysis in 2013. The primary analysis that I'm gonna share is based on students that actively consented to participate in the program. These were third through eighth graders. Uh, we had a population of uh, about 1,000 students. Um, in that group, the mean age was uh, about 10 and a half years of age. About half were male and half were female. Uh, they were largely um, minority, 83% Hispanic in this particular district. Uh, we also conducted additional analysis on a broader population uh, that were passively consented uh, in which uh, they, they did not um, need to provide any demographic information whatsoever. Um, that's a much broader population, about 5,900 students, uh, first through eighth grade. A little bit on the data collection process. Um, we start uh, by weighing representative sampling of all of the foods that are offered in school on a particular day. 
Uh, we randomly select 10 samples and capture uh, starting weights of those foods. Um, we label trays with student IDs. Um, these are uh, for the students that have actively participated. For those that were not uh, actively participating, um, they would just get a grade um, and a, a gender assignment. Uh, we collected trays after lunch. You can see here uh, one of our research assistants is neatly stacking thousands <laughs> of half-eaten uh, <coughs> trays of food. Um, and then we weigh the plate waste and we record the results for analysis. Okay. And so here, here are the <coughs> results. Um, we looked at selection and also at consumption. And so pre-implementation of the new USDA guidelines, uh, in, these, uh, in these schools, 100% uh, of students were selecting uh, the entree portion. Um, and as far as consumption is concerned, um, the active consent portion of the population was consuming about 72.3% of the meals on average, um, and about 63% uh, for the passively consented uh, group. Um, after implementation, there was no change in selection, um, but consumption actually uh, rose slightly. There were no other intervention in, the, in these schools. Uh, milk, there was a, a, sig a significant reduction in selection uh, and also consumption. And um, this is because the district that we were studying chose to um, eliminate service of flavored milk. Um, that was independent of the study. Um, so what you're seeing here is you're seeing consumption and selection based right at the year after uh, flavored milk was removed from the schools. Uh, we do have some data from another plate waste study that we ran in 2009 in the Boston Public Schools that's, that suggests that after uh, about a year of removing flavored milk, that that consumption and selection does rebound. And we can speak about that during the uh, discussion portion, perhaps. Um, as far as fruit was concerned, there was uh, not relatively little change um, in selection. Um, I, I take that back. Um, there was a, a big change in selection, relatively little change in consumption. Uh, and that was due largely to the fact that the fruit that was being offered um, was typically what they were seeing before. These were whole apples, whole oranges, whole bananas. Uh, not a big change in the, in the type of food being offered. Uh, but kids were required to take now, uh, due to the changes in offer versus serve, kids were required to take a vegetable or a fruit. And so um, there was a, a significant change in selection. As far as vegetables are concerned, uh, not a huge change in selection. Kids were, um, the kids that were taking vegetables were still taking vegetables. The kids uh, that had to take one or the other were, were choosing fruit. However, what we did see was a significant increase in consumption um, across vegetables. And this has to do uh, a lot with the way the vegetables were presented, and I'll speak to that a little bit uh, as well. Um, Dr. Uh, Briefel mentioned that, there, uh, that school infrastructure plays a large part in, um, in what's being served in schools and the ability of schools to offer healthier foods. And I want to share just some images from what we see. Uh, this is an example of a full service kitchen um, where there are uh, facilities to cook from scratch, if you will. Um, and a lot of the offerings that you might see in a school like that um, would reflect you know, the ability of staff to actually prepare healthier offerings. And that's it, the infamous pizza, <laughs> home, homemade, wow. whole grain crust. Um, this is what a lot of schools have for a kitchen uh, across America. They tend to be elementary schools. Uh, in the early 70s, um, there was a cutting back of infrastructure funding uh, for building kitchens in schools. And as a result, a number of schools have what are called satellite kitchens. And they typically are uh, just a warming oven, a retherm oven. Uh, that can fit in a closet typically. And the meals that you see served in these schools yeah. um, are more representative of what you might remember from before the implementation of the new guidelines, um, chicken nuggets and french fries. Now, this is post-implementation of the guidelines. This still meets the new guidelines, just to put that out there. <laughs> the company that makes these meals serves 1.5 million of these meals across the country every day. And so this is what districts are <coughs> serving because their infrastructure doesn't <coughs> allow them to do um, much different. Note the side of vegetable here. There's potatoes hidden. <laughs> in there. 
Oh. Okay. And note the fruit is uh, is very similar to what you see in a full service school potentially. So I'm now just going to share some very quick results from um, a community that is serving as the control for our chef's intervention study, which is going to be forthcoming. And I'm comparing that to the post-implementation consumption levels that I just shared with you. Okay, just to give you a sense of what happens in a full service district versus one of these districts that has um, the prepared meals. And so the two communities are, are demographically very similar, um, both high low income and high minority populations. Um, in terms of fruit consumption and selection, you'll notice not a big change between the community um, in our pilot study and in our forthcoming study with a control group. Um, and that's due to the fact that the fruit is very similar. Um, an apple is an apple. You'll see a difference in entrees, however, um, between the full serve schools where they're actually preparing it fresh and the frozen entrees. Selection is similar, consumption is very different. And it becomes even more stark for vegetables. Where a lot of the vegetable, that side vegetable, which is, you know, let's say steamed broccoli, over steamed broccoli, comes frozen, um, is ending up right in the trash. And then milk is, uh, is also uh, an interesting thing to look at. I just wanted to show the difference between white milk consumption and flavored milk consumption. I mentioned that the district we were working in had removed flavored milk the year um, in the interim between the uh, our first uh, baseline year and our second um, post-implementation year. Um, the district that is serving as our control for the follow-on study has not removed flavored milk. So you can see a comparison here. Uh, I think what's most striking here is not just the fact that kids are taking flavored milk when it's offered, um, but that the consumption <coughs> rates between white milk and flavored milk are actually, they actually start to get closer. So the kids that are choosing white milk in our control community are actually consuming it in somewhat similar rates to, um, to what kids are, are drinking of their flavored milk. Um, and that suggests that the rebound starts to happen um, when kids get used to, to unflavored milk. Um, and that is it. I have a number of backup slides that we can share for, uh, for discussion. Thank you. Thank you.